of the bands I cover on One Hit Wonderland are a product of their time. The Proclaimers are not one of them. The Proclaimers exist outside of trends, outside of fashion, possibly outside of the realm of human knowledge and reason. It almost seems wrong to believe they were ever in our dimension at all, but they were, arriving in America in 1993 to proclaim that they would walk 500 miles and they would walk 500 more. To say their success was unlikely is underselling it. You simply just do not see people like this in music, except as joke contestants on Britain's Got Talent. Any sane person would tell you that these aren't really musicians, they're a Mike Myers character that somehow got brought to life and cloned. And by the way, here is Mike Myers himself as half of the Proclaimers, because how the hell could he possibly not? Michael Jordan! Michael Jordan! Michael Jordan! It is kind of a singular anomaly in music. Very rare is the one hit wonder who can boast dozens of recognizable parodies, and yet the Proclaimers were instantly identifiable with their intensely unfashionable image, their nigh indecipherable Scottish accent, and there's two of them. They were too unique to ignore, but too weird to keep around, and eventually we sent them back on the boat to Edinburgh. But who exactly were these nerds with brogues thicker than Scrooge McDuck? And is there a secret meaning behind their biggest hit? Well, we're about to take a closer look at the pride and joy of Bonnie Scotland. Da da da! Da da da! The Proclaimers are identical twins Craig and Charlie Reed, which, quite frankly, that, that doesn't strike me as Scottish enough names to describe these guys. If it were up to me, they would go by Angus McHaggis McDougal and Tam O'Shanter the Bruce, and they'd dress like Groundskeeper Willie, but you know, that, that might be going overboard a bit. Or would it? I mean, the Proclaimers is a pretty good name for them because they are proclaiming loudly and proudly without shame their identity. And that identity is two very, very Scottish dorks. Or alternately, two very, very dorky Scots. And just to stack the deck against them even more in the music world, they were just an acoustic duo when they started. And they started in the mid-80s. Like, mid-80s, did Scotland have a presence in pop music? Yeah, but they didn't sound like the Proclaimers. Don't you forget about me. A Scottish band having a Scottish accent was itself kind of a big deal at the time. They were one of the few Scottish bands who sounded something other than English or American, let alone drew upon the traditions of Scottish folk music. Again, in 1987. There was absolutely no precedent for these guys in the world. The closest were the very proudly Celtic ensemble known as Dexy's Midnight Runners, who were a big inspiration to the Reed Boys and were a previous feature on this show. You know, when you're being inspired by a one-hit wonder, you can't be surprised if you don't have more than one big hit yourself, right? But then again, the Proclaimers probably couldn't give two craps about racking up tons of Billboard chart toppers anyway, so whatever. Like, that whole image did not happen by accident. I've been so sad. She said my accent was bad. Their entire first single is about how they're not going to change their accent. I'm just gonna have to learn to hesitate and make sure my work on this accent is no pain. But I would know a single word they say if I found all the balls and I threw the out of way. You just don't see enough people using Saxon as an insult. I'm gonna start doing that like look at that filthy Saxon. Don't think that they were only a bunch of silly goofballs though, they had their serious side too. Their first major hit was Letter from America, which is about how most of the Scots in the world were living far away from the home country, which, you know, was not doing so well at the time. From Miami to Canada. A year later, they released their second album, Sunshine on Leith. Their first single was the title track, and it remains very popular in Scotland. Leith is a section of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, like I said, they weren't particularly concerned about being accessible outside of Scotland. You. You'll notice they decided to mix it up a bit by becoming an electric band. I like this one. But it was their second single off that album that would be the one that would bring them to the forefront of pop culture. The awkwardly parentheses classic, I'm Gonna Be 500 Miles. 
but This was not big. When I wake up it was 1988. America was not ready for the Proclaimers. Did pretty well in the UK though. After that, the Proclaimers were pretty quiet for a while. Except for a single EP where they covered the country classic King of the Road, they basically released nothing for many years and their biggest concern appeared to be saving their favorite soccer team from shutting down. But eventually they did put together a real album and by 1993 were just putting the finishing touches on it. But before they released it, this happened. The entire reason you've heard of The Proclaimers is a Johnny Depp movie from 1993 called Benny and June. In it, Johnny Depp plays either Benny or June, and ends up romancing Mary Stuart Masterson. You know, it's one of those quirky, kooky romance movies. By kooky, I mean that one of the lead characters has an actual diagnosed mental illness. Not really one of Johnny Depp's better remembered films, but I remember liking it. Mary Stuart Masterson was allegedly such a fan of the band that she lobbied to include one of their songs in the movie. If you just want to watch the movie to see where the Proclaimers crop up, it's the first scene, so you don't have to wait that long. Okay, having now perused my way through the Proclaimers discography, I would say solidly that I'm gonna be 500 miles is the simplest even dare I say the stupidest song they ever made. I mean, that's basically its entire appeal, how dopey and corny and happy and love it is. All the lines in the verses are basically the same. When he performs an action, he's gonna be the one who performs that action next to you. When he goes out, when he does anything, When they haver, they're gonna haver next to you. They would haver for a thousand miles if they could haver next to you. Seriously, haver? What the hell does that mean? Does that mean, I don't know, babbling out nonsense words? Huh. Okay, that's exactly what it means. They're called the Proclaimers for another reason. They are proclaiming. I, I mean, listen to them, they are just hollering, like, at the top of their lungs, you know, da da da! And you can't say it once for enthusiasm. They've got conviction. You genuinely believe that they would literally walk 500 miles, probably while singing this song, without stopping. It's, uh, it's exuberant, and I'll be honest, it's a little obnoxious. There is probably a version of Hell where this song plays on loop, but uh, at the same time, you would have to be some kind of seriously insufferable grumpy fans to say you didn't like this song at least a little. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly there is to say about this song. It's just this big, upbeat, doofy, karaoke sing-along. Certainly Craig and Charlie there were very happy about his success. After such a long break, what better hype could they have hoped for for their upcoming album? Truly, the 90s would be the era of the Proclaimers. Okay, let's be serious. There was never going to be a second hit for the Proclaimers. You can't really call it failing when the Proclaimers don't have another hit in America. That's it's like saying Garth Brooks failed to have a hit in Thailand. That said, why did 500 Miles become a hit and not anything from their next album? Well, they didn't seem to have that knockout single like 500 Miles was. They just weren't a pop act. They weren't designed to have hits. The singles did try and follow 500 Miles by playing up the silly love song aspects of their personalities. Let's get their first single was a sincere proposal song called Let's Get Married, but after 500 Miles, it's just a little underwhelming. Their second single was even more of a joke song, but it didn't do well at all. Those suits are as fashionable as they ever got, by the way. I thought you liked football. You didn't mind no videos. And my dog didn't mean to ruin your clothes. He I just really can't be surprised that these songs didn't really catch fire. Yeah, I think ultimately they were just too folky and too foreign to really ever be big in the States. This album didn't do all that well in England either. Like I said, they were just not ones to care all that much about crossover appeal. 
The final single from that album was a cover of an old Otis Redding song, and after that they once again disappeared from music altogether. Their dad got sick and they went on a very long hiatus while they took care of him and not recording another album until 2001. But they've recorded like clockwork ever since, like a new album every couple years. Weird to think that they recorded the majority of their output in their 40s, but then again they both looked like someone's dad even when they were young. This is my favorite song by them by the way. They never change their MO very much, they still alternate between sincerity and outright silliness. Actually, I think this might be the stupidest thing they ever recorded. They also show up on movie soundtracks all the time. You may remember hearing them in the background of Shrek and in Dumb and Dumber and literally like a dozen other movies. And Christ, they've just been really productive. In, in Scotland, there's an entire musical based around their songs. It's called Sunshine on Leith, and it's got great reviews. Now, oh, there's a quote. And it's getting made into a movie. It's being released in like a few months. Also in 2007, they had their first number one hit in the UK when they re-recorded their only hit with some comedians for the charity Comic Relief. UK, I gotta ask, is it, is it just for charity you buy these awful Comic Relief singles? Because you've got all these Comic Relief songs and they're always just terrible and whatever. Better? They seem to be doing pretty well for themselves. Look, it should come as a surprise to no one that the Proclaimers are still hometown heroes in Scotland, where they regularly sell out concerts all the time. But also, they're, you know, they're just a definition of a band you'd want around. They weren't redundant, they had a unique style and a unique image, they were pretty talented songwriters, and they had one giant hit that has kept them working and will pay their rent for the rest of their lives. The fact that they never bent to trends has served them well. That's a big reason their careers have persisted far longer than most of their contemporaries. Then again, I can only imagine the colossal failure that would have happened if they'd ever tried to be hip in the 80s or in the 90s. Now, they just were who they were, and still are. Soon I imagine the Proclaimers will be called back to their home planet, and that will be a tragedy when it happens. But for the time being, I am proud to proclaim, yes, the Proclaimers are a good band. I salute you Proclaimers, may you continue walking those 500 miles. Yeah.